Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Fill in the Blanks. I'm Dr. Phil, of course. It's the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, and I'm hoping everybody had a good Thanksgiving. Let you know what I did over Thanksgiving. Robin and I were together with uh, family. I'm sure all of you know that we have two boys and two daughter-in-laws and three grandchildren. Fortunately, we were able to be with family over the break, spend time together, and ate too much, of course, but that's okay. It was just one day and didn't feel too bad, played tennis in the morning and then had kind of a late afternoon dinner and just got to spend time hanging out and being with each other, so we enjoyed it, and I hope you had time to connect with people in your life whether it was in person or electronically or whatever. So hope you got to take a break and do that with your family one way or the other. On to the business of the night or of the day, whenever you may be listening. We've been talking about toxic personalities in the real world. You know, we covered narcissism. And then last week we started talking about borderline personalities and This is the second time I'm talking about borderline personality because you encounter a lot of people like this, I know, because you've asked me about it a lot. And if you didn't catch last time, then it's in the library and you can go back and listen to it. Just a quick focus, borderline personality disorder is kind of what we're talking about when this is present in the extreme. But remember, I said that all of us are on a behavioral continuum. And you may have a lot of the characteristics that we're talking about with borderline personality disorder, but you may not have them to the extreme, or you might be married to someone or have a sibling or someone you work with that has some of these characteristics, but they don't have them all or they don't have them to the degree that they would qualify as having the disorder. So when I talk about it, I'm talking about it in the extreme when it reaches the level of being diagnosable. And to be diagnosed, there are like nine characteristics of the borderline personality that went over last time. You can see them. I'll talk about them quickly here in a minute. You only have to have five of the nine to get the diagnosis. But we're talking here about patterns. You know, somebody might have these traits or characteristics or symptoms pop up for a day or two or in crisis, but not in pattern. So that doesn't mean that they have a borderline personality disorder. It just might pop up in pattern. But it's defined as a pervasive pattern of instability of interpersonal relationships or instability of self image or emotions. And Marked impulsivity. These are really impulsive people. It's usually beginning by early adulthood, and it's present in a variety of contexts. So it's not just specific to home or then specific to work. It's present in a variety of contexts. That means they're the common denominator. They take this with them wherever they go. This personality disorder is really unique in how unstable these people are in their emotions and in their relationships with vast changes that happen really fast. Sometimes this can be confused with bipolar disorder that has mania involved in it, but the difference is with a bipolar personality, these changes can happen within an hour. They can be happy, sad, and mad all within a very short period of time, for no apparent reason. You go, oh my gosh, what did I do to trigger this? The answer is probably nothing or maybe everything because they bring this with them. You know, you've heard me say, when you enter into a relationship, you bring things with you that either contribute or contaminate the relationship. And people with borderline personality disorder bring this instability with them that contaminate the relationships that they get into impulsivity, for example. And so I'm going to talk today about how you deal with that, how you handle it. And let me tell you, these are not evil people. I always say 
that if you just look past the obvious emotions and ask yourself, wonder why this person is doing this, wonder why they're behaving or feeling or expressing the emotions they are, that it tends to bring out compassion in you. And that's what I'm asking you to do here. These people are miserable people much of the time. That's why they're doing what they're doing. They're not doing this to just make you miserable, although they may be making you miserable. They're miserable themselves. Just ask yourself, when you see someone like this that can't keep a relationship, that they're happy one minute, crying the next, raging the next, ask yourself what it must be like to live that way day after day, month after month, year after year, never be able to sustain a relationship, ride that emotional roller coaster all the time, what it must be like for them. So I'm asking you to be empathetic here. These people are really oftentimes in a lot of pain. And so I'm asking you to just be aware of that. So they do ride this emotional roller coaster. And as a result of these rapid swings, they try to get you on that roller coaster with them. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is how not to get on that roller coaster and how to guard against ever getting sucked in to begin with. Look, these people, when you meet them, they're going to come on really strong, really fast. They may idolize you in the very beginning, and you think, wow, this is great. I mean, you're getting love bombed. This person is loving you up, and they're telling you how great and intriguing and interesting and fascinating you are. But in a very short time, they're going to likely turn on you and talk about how you have ruined everything, ruined them, rejected them, hurt them. Why did you do this to me? Let me tell you, you don't want to sit on a pedestal. It's a long way to fall. And so one of the things you can do is resist them putting you up on that pedestal. It might seem like, oh, this is fun. (laughs) I like being idolized. I like being worshipped here. I like this person loving everything I say and everything I do. No, you you don't, because there's no way you can live up to that, even if they weren't borderline personality, and you certainly can't live up to it if they are a borderline personality. So all relationships with these people, they get into them really fast. Everything moves real fast. They get deep into the relationship. They fall in love fast. They fall out of love fast. Look, People that live in the emotional extremes, and borderline personalities do this, they live in the emotional extremes. And people that live in the emotional extremes, either extremely happy or extremely sad, they also make extreme movements. So if they live in the extremes of the emotions, then you can expect them to make radical changes because they don't populate the middle range of just Oh, you know, that's annoying. No, no, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to them. That's how they react to it. So people that live in the emotional extremes make radical moves to the other emotional extreme. So they may love you one minute and be so upset with you the next that it's just terrible for you and for them. Now, they also have the same roller coaster and confusion about how they feel with regard to themselves. As I said last week, you might even actually hear them say, I don't even know who I am anymore. Maybe they never did. There's an identity disturbance with these people. These are not folks that know who they are. And think about it. How do we know other people? You have an image of other people. You have formed an opinion of other people. And how do you do that? Well, it's the same way we form our self-image. You watch what people do, right? You watch what they do. Let's say you've got somebody that you work with, and maybe they are there 15 minutes early every day. And when you get there, they're always there. You can set your watch by them. They've got the place unlocked. They've got the lights on. They got the coffee going. They've turned on the music in the place, and you just know they're going to be there every day. And if they aren't there, you think, yeah, something's wrong, because this person is reliable as they can be. 
How do you assign reliability to them? How do you assign dependability to them? By watching them, and based on their patterns of behavior, you make attributions to them. You assign certain traits and characteristics to them based on your experience of them. Well, that's really hard for borderline personality people to do because they aren't consistent. They observe themselves too, and they know, wow, I can't keep a relationship. All of my relationships are filled with drama. I feel abandoned every time I get in a relationship. Everybody seems to turn away from me. I I can't trust anybody. I don't have feelings of intimacy. Every time I do, I get hurt. Why is that? Well, because things that you might let roll off your back, they take so personal and they exaggerate and blow out of proportion so bad that they do feel like everybody abandons them. Everybody doesn't abandon them. But you might call and say, hey, I'm really tired today. Can I take a rain check on dinner? We were going to go out to dinner tonight. Can I take a rain check? If a friend did that with you, you might say, sure, I understand. Let's let's do it tomorrow night or maybe this weekend. Not somebody with a borderline personality. To them, they go, oh, you don't care about me anymore. You don't like me anymore. You don't love me anymore. You're abandoning me. So they would take something like that, get very paranoid about it, and blow it way out of proportion. So they don't have self-confidence. They don't know who they are. They don't know that they're worthy. So that really gets under their skin. They have what we call an identity disturbance. They're very unclear or shifting in their self-image. And so you'll see it in their sense of self. You'll see it in their style. They might come dressed in one style one day and a completely different one the next day. They might make radical changes in their hair. They might cut their hair off. They might dye their hair different colors. I mean, radically different. So they'll change style, their fashion, their hair. They may even speak in different accents from one day to another, and you're going, now, whoa, this is really strange, because I know she's from Texas, but she's talking like she's from London. Well, she's not just playing a role. She's confused, and she's searching for some identity, or he's playing a role. Maybe he's been influenced by somebody, and he's behaving that way. And I'm saying he or she here because... This affects both. I'm going to talk about some of the myths here in just a minute. Now, we also talked about last week that there are four subtypes here, those that are discouraged and quiet, the really impulsive ones where that's the primary characteristic. These are the ones that are energetic and charismatic. They can also be very cold and hostile, but they're easily bored. They take high-risk behaviors. They're also the ones that are into self-mutilation sometimes and are at high risk for suicidal behavior. They're very resistant to treatment. There's the petulant. These are the ones that are angry. They feel very unworthy. They tend to have more eating disorders with this particular subgroup. And then there are the self-destructive. They're the bitter, self-hatred. These are the attention seekers. And talk about high-risk behaviors. These are the reckless drivers, drugs. They're promiscuous. A lot of eating disorders here. So there are four different types, and those are on the website, and I talked about them last week. Now, here's the thing that you need to understand about these folks. I said to approach them with some compassion, but boundaries. These folks don't experience this in isolation. There's a lot of what we call comorbidity. It occurs with a high frequency of anxiety, depression, eating disorders, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, PTSD. It does occur with bipolar. It's often misdiagnosed, but they can have both. They can have changes that happen within the hour or within a day, and they can also be bipolar where there are cycles that take much longer to cycle around. Now, 
Dr. Perry Hoffman with the National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorders made this observation, and I thought it was really interesting. She said, this is one of the disorders that really needs an interpersonal relationship to express itself most of the time. You could take a schizophrenic, for example, and just parachute them on to a deserted island alone, and you would still observe their schizophrenic behavior. Let's say they had auditory or visual hallucinations. They would still have them on a deserted island by themselves, and you would be able to observe and see that if you had hidden cameras and you were monitoring them. The borderline personality disorder, you might not see nearly as readily because it's so relationship dependent. It's based on how they interact with other people, and there's nobody there to interact with. It wouldn't be as obvious. Now, there is disturbance of identity of self, so there might still be evidence in the fact that they didn't know who they were as clearly. They didn't have a clear, well-defined self-image but that would be pretty internal, and so you wouldn't see it as obviously. But I thought Dr. Huffman had a great observation when she said this is one of those disorders that's relationship-dependent. You have to be in a relationship for it to fully manifest itself. So you might have someone that you're observing in your life, and if they're not in a relationship, maybe they're in IT, they're working in computers or something, and you don't observe them in a relationship, these things might not pop out until you start interacting with them or you start observing them in a relationship with somebody else. Now, I want to talk about some of the myths. I want to clear some of those things up, and then I want to talk to you about how to live with these people and how to cope with these people. One of the myths that I hear a lot is that if somebody has a borderline personality, then they've been victimized as a child, that they were victims of child abuse. That's not true. There is a high incidence of child abuse with borderline personality disorders, but the research tells us that it's more likely a combination of environmental factors, including childhood trauma. There may have been childhood trauma. But there are also biological factors, and there are also social factors. So it's not just that they were abused as a child that sets them up for borderline personality. There are other things that contribute to it as well. So it's not just that. And everyone that suffered childhood abuse doesn't become a borderline personality disorder. So neither is true. Not all borderline personality disorders were abused as a child, and not all people that were abused as children become borderline personality disorders. So there's not a one-to-one connection between the two. Again, it seems to be a combination of factors, and there is a biological genetic factor there, too. You could be more at risk if somebody in your family has suffered from the disorder as well. So It's not as simple as just, was this person abused as a child? So don't jump to that conclusion. One of the other myths, and this has been around a long time, and there are even some statistics to support it, but the statistics are misleading. And that is that this shows up only in women or much, much more frequently in women than it does in men. But when you do careful study, the results show that it's about equal between men and women. Now, most of the research is based on the psychiatric population, and more women present for treatment than do men. And men are oftentimes diagnosed as having something else wrong with them. Men are often misdiagnosed as having depression or PTSD rather than borderline personality disorder. So there's an overrepresentation of women 
in the psychiatric population, not because there are more women that have psychiatric disorders, just they tend to present for treatment more, whereas men tend to be more stoic and resist treatment more. So they don't present themselves to be diagnosed. And then when they do present themselves, they are more frequently misdiagnosed for the comorbid things that show up with borderline personality. So don't anybody tell you now this is just women. If you're dating someone or you have a man in your life, brother, husband, father, you know, some relative or coworker or whatever that's a man, and you think, boy, I tell you, I, he sure seems to have all the characteristics or many of them, you may be exactly right because this isn't just women. It's about 50-50 between men and women. The third myth I want to talk about is this is not treatable. That's wrong. It is treatable. I mentioned last week that Dr. Linehan, who's one of the leading experts in borderline personality disorder, made the comment, if you ever show up, I'm paraphrasing her now, if you ever show up in the emergency room and you have the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, don't mention it because there's more stigma associated with borderline personality disorder than almost anything else. And if you tell some ER intern that you have borderline personality disorder, they're likely to go, oh, okay, I get it and write you off and not take seriously what you have to say because they know that you're impulsive. They know that you dramatize. They know that you take everything so personally and over-exaggerate. So they're going to discount the things that you say. It's like the little boy that cried wolf. They're not going to listen to you when you have something really wrong with you. So she wasn't kidding when she said you probably don't want to lead with that or you might not get taken very seriously because people think it's a very serious disorder and one that you can't really help, that these people don't get better. And that's not true. It is treatable. And I've had a lot of questions from people that felt like they were raised by a parent that had a borderline personality disorder. They just had a lot of questions about how does this affect me if I've been raised by someone like that? Have I been programmed? You know, Dr. Phil, you said it wasn't just childhood trauma. It was also biological. Am I genetically programmed to have this? What have they done to me by me being raised by someone that has these traits and characteristics that you've been describing? What do I need to watch for? Am I likely to pass this along to my own kids? How do I stop this generational thing? There's a Dr. Cynthia Newman that's done a lot of research on how children of borderline personality disorders need to cope and what they need to watch for. Borderline personality disorder parents are often threatened by their very own children. And borderline personalities have a defense mechanism called splitting. It's a defense mechanism where they tend to see things black or white. It's either all good or all bad. There's no middle ground. It's called splitting. You can look it up and read about it. It's very interesting. But they put things in two categories. And remember, I said these people live in the emotional extremes. So if you're dealing with a borderline personality, one of their defense mechanisms is to categorize things in black or white. It's either all good or all bad. That's a way that they decide whether something is okay or it's not okay and they write it off accordingly. And if they put you in the all bad category, you get written off. And they do that with their children. They could have one child that they decide is all good and the other child is all bad. And if you're the all bad, then you can feel written off by your parent. And the reason is you were. 
you were written off by your parent because they put you in that category. And that's going to damage your self-worth. It's going to damage your self-esteem. You're not going to feel appreciated. Now, being raised by this kind of parent can cause the child to become anxious, confused, fearful, and untrusting. Why? Because their parent's not predictable. They think, okay, one minute the parent is all happy and loving, and it can be 15 minutes and they're in there raging at them or blaming them for everything that they, the parent, are feeling or everything that's going wrong in the parent's life, they're blaming on the child. And so the child is confused. It's like, what the hell just happened? What did I do? Why am I causing my parents so much anguish here? And I I know it's me because they told me it was. So if they're splitting and put you in the all bad category and then they're in there telling you how you're to blame for all the ills in their life, then you come out feeling a lot of shame and a lot of guilt and really damaged in your personal truth. Your personal truth, what you believe about yourself at the core of your soul, the core of your being, has taken a real beating. And so that means you're very likely to see the world as a threatening place. You're very likely to feel hopelessly lost. And children of borderline personalities feel like they have to separate from their parent in order to survive. And guess what? (laughs) You're right. You need to get away from that kind of programming, that kind of input, that kind of battering, that kind of emotional abuse. The sooner you can get away from that and get into a safe, nurturing place, the better off you are. The sooner you can safely do that, the better off you are. Children have been raised this way get real good at reading other people because you become hypersensitized to watching your borderline parent because you're watching for this mood change. You want to know when to duck and run, when to find somewhere else to be, when to get out of the situation where you don't have to put up with all of the wailing and blaming and shaming and crying and all of that. So you learn to watch and read but they don't learn to measure their own internal emotions. They don't learn to measure what's real within themselves and pay attention to how they're feeling. They don't label their own emotions. They don't realize, hey, I'm feeling a lot of shame here. And so they're real good at reading other people, but not real good at reading themselves. They do have strong feelings of shame. There's a lot of codependency there because they're reflecting this caregiver, this mother or father that's engaging them, sucking them in. Children find a hard time setting up boundaries, so they get sucked in by this instability terribly. And then, as I say, if you're on the bad side of that splitting, uh, boy, it can be really, really tough. If you're living with a borderline personality parent or you've been raised by a borderline personality parent, think about it. You'll spot these things if you look back now. They'll describe opportunities as being completely safe or total con. Don't go out with this person. Don't let them be your friend. They'll describe your friends as either evil and crooked or just absolute saints. These are just angels. They're just perfect. When they hear something, you know, we've been through the pandemic and you've got a lot of people talking about COVID and should you wear a mask or not? Should you get vaccinated or not? Should you quarantine or not? Et cetera, et cetera. In splitting, they're going to decide this is either a complete lie or it's the absolute gospel. They won't take it all in and weigh the preponderance of the evidence and make a decision based on the different facts, evaluate them carefully, thoughtfully, and make an informed decision. No, 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 no. They're going to decide this is either the 
absolute gospel truth or it's a complete lie. Again, they live in the emotional extremes. You just need to watch out for it and know that this is something that can be treated. If you've been raised by a person like this or you know somebody that can, just know that they do respond to treatment. And, you know, what is the treatment? Well, it's a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. Dialectical behavior therapy is an evidence based therapy that does have some good success with borderline personalities. Now, I'm not saying that you cure this and all of a sudden it just goes away, but DBT is a cognitive behavior therapy with added strong emphasis on change, acceptance, and acceptance on balance change. We're talking about identity and change of negative internal dialogue and pushing for positive behavioral change. And what I mean by identifying and changing negative internal dialogue is you get the person to listen to what they're saying to themselves. Because if you heard the internal dialogue of a borderline personality disorder individual, they're saying a lot of catastrophic things to themselves. And I'm a big believer in the power of language. And ask yourself what you're saying to yourself. Do you use a lot of catastrophic language? Are you the kind of person that says, oh, that was just horrible. My day was horrible. Well, words are very powerful, and they bring a lot of meaning with them, a lot of baggage with them. And if you say something, oh, it was the most horrible day of my life, it was just terrible, it was just catastrophic, those are big words as opposed to, eh, it was a very annoying day. The difference between horrible and annoying are really different when you stop and think about them. Horrible is having full death burns over 70% of your body. That's horrible. Having to put up with this annoying person sitting next to you at work who talks all the time and bugs you, that's not horrible. That's inconvenient. That's annoying. So part of dialectical behavior therapy is getting the person to listen to what they're saying to themselves, identifying what they say to themselves that's really negative. You're no good. Nobody likes you. Everybody's abandoning you. This was horrible. It was terrible. And changing that and then pushing for positive behavioral changes, behaving their way to success. There's also a focus on distress tolerance. It focuses on acceptance of situations. It is what it is. Deal with it. It's not trying to blow smoke up and say, oh, hey, everything's fine. Everything's not fine in life. And there's a lot of value in learning to accept the fact that everything's not fine and toughening up where you have some tolerance for distress. So you don't fold in the face of any kind of adversity. DBT helps these people, particularly those with borderline personalities, to not overreact, to just say, okay, that was not good, but I can handle that. It raises their tolerance for distress where they don't melt down and fall apart emotionally whenever they face adversity. They come up with change-oriented strategies. Here's how we're going to do this differently. You used to do A, we're going to learn how to do B. And they teach interpersonal effectiveness as part of this therapy. Here's how to handle your relationships in a way that are much better for you than what you've been doing. You know, a big part of this 
is what's called mindfulness. And this is often where each session will begin. You develop the ability to observe and accept versus judging and avoiding. Now think about that. Observe and accept what's going on in your life, in your relationships, at your job, at home. You observe it. Say, okay, I see what's going on here. And I'm going to learn to accept that instead of judge it and run from it. That's what I mean about distress tolerance. Mindfulness is a big part of this. Awareness of the moment. You live in the moment and you learn to accept it. You focus on the moment and accept your feelings, thoughts, and your body sensations and say, okay, I'm okay with this. I can live with this. And this is kind of a meditative exercise where body, behavior, emotional awareness without judgment. You might say, I get anxious when I come into a room because I'm so used to being rejected and abandoned that I get this anticipatory anxiety. Well, okay. All right. We're not telling you you don't. What we're telling you is acknowledge that and learn to live with it. We're not trying to tell you to pretend that that doesn't happen. Then it happens. Then, okay, let's learn to observe that and accept it. If you walk in the room and it happens and you've learned to observe it and accept it, then you say, okay, this is the anxiety that I knew was going to happen. It always happens. And it always goes down. It always abates after a little time. So I'm going to accept this. I'm not going to judge it. It just is. And maybe I'll learn how to deal with this at some point, but right now I'm just going to observe it and I'm going to accept it. You identify these difficult emotions without self-criticism. It's not about whether they should be or not. They just are. Think about that, because that's good for everybody, in my opinion, whether you are dealing with a borderline personality or not. Sometimes we just have to accept what is. This just is. This is just part of our life, and we have to raise our distress tolerance levels. And I have to say, I think the world could really benefit from raising our distress tolerance right now because it seems like we're pretty hair-triggered. And I think if everybody could toughen up a little bit and not be so hair-triggered and so quick to be offended, even at ourselves, we would be better off. It's about the here and now. It's not about focusing on the past or the future. It's not judging yourself for the past. You always do this. You've done this a million times. I'm so sick of you. No, no, we're not going there. We're not going to live in the past. You know, there's a reason that your rearview mirror is so small and your windshield is so big because that rearview mirror focuses on what's behind you and that windshield lets all the light in to the moment of where you are right now. And that's what we want to focus on is right now. Focusing on the moment really helps you get into stress reduction. So there is a way to teach borderline personality disorders to be less reactive and more accepting of themselves and others. and. Research tells us this is what's called an evidence-based therapy, meaning that there is evidence that this therapy does have positive results for those that have this disorder. Now, I want to talk about some do's and don'ts. Here are some do's. If you have borderline personality people in your life, or you are a borderline personality. Do get educated. You do want to learn about this disorder. And the thing is, if you've got a laptop, iPad, smartphone, computer, you're walking around with a library 
you know what a library is. It's a big building with books in it. We used to have to go there to get information. Now we can just kind of punch it up and read it. You want to educate yourself. Knowledge is power. And if you can educate yourself about this disorder, it will help you cope with it, whether it's you dealing with somebody else or dealing with yourself. You do want to get personal help or support because you have to take care of yourself. It's particularly important if you're living with someone that has borderline personality. And you may say, hey, Dr. Phil, you're my helpline. I I don't have money to go to a therapist or whatever. Okay, maybe this is your education. And there are support groups out there. You can find them on the internet. People that live with borderline personalities, that were raised by borderline personalities. But the important thing is you've got to take care of yourself. When you're dealing with a borderline personality, you want to use open-ended questions in what I call a two-way communication model. Now, I want to take a minute to spend on this. You don't want to ask yes or no questions. You want to ask open-ended questions. And an example is, you can say what you want them to hear you saying, but you need to finish it with, tell me what you hear me saying. Because if you don't, You have no idea how they've interpreted what you've said. You may say, hey, listen, um, I'm going to have to cancel our plans this weekend because my mom called and she's coming in town, so I'm going to have to entertain her this weekend. So is that okay? That's not an open-ended question because you're going to get a yes or no. Is that okay? Yes. You don't know what they heard you say, how they interpreted what you said. You may have said, hey, my mom's coming in this weekend, and so I'm going to need to spend time with her and have dinner for her Saturday night at the house instead of meeting you and going to a movie and dinner. Okay? Yes, sure. What they may have heard you say and how they may interpret that is, I'm tired of you. I don't want to spend time with you anymore. You're not good enough for me. I'm not going to spend any more time investing in you, and I'm leaving you like everybody else in your life has, okay? (laughs) You say, well, wait a minute, that's not what I said. No, but that's what they heard. And in a two-way communication model, there's a feedback loop where you say, tell me what you heard me say. And you may say, well, that's kind of offensive, isn't it? No, it's not. Just explain and then say, I'm going to take care of my mom this weekend, so tell me what you're hearing me say. If you said, do you understand, that would be yes or no. You've got to finish it with, tell me what you're hearing me say. Give me some feedback. And then they will reveal, well, I hear you saying that somebody's a lot more important to you than I am. Whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) That's not what I said. This is about timing. My mother's coming in. I see you 52 weeks a year. I see her two weeks a year. So I need to spend time with her. And I'm going to really ask that you support that for me and not take that personal. I want you to understand that. Can you tell me what I'm feeling here? Can you tell me why I would say that to you? Get that feedback loop. It's two-way communication. That's very important. You do want to encourage responsibility. Don't fix everything for these people. You want to encourage responsibility. Do take threats seriously every single time time you hear them from a borderline personality. 
if they make threats, I've had all this I can take. I'm just, I don't even want to be in this world anymore. That's a veiled suicidal threat. Do take that seriously. The Suicide Prevention Hotline is 1-800-273-8255, 1-800-273-8255, or 911. And you may think, look, they're just pulling my chain. This is emotional extortion. They're just trying to leverage me so I'll do what they want me to do. You may be right, but you're not qualified to make that decision. I'm not sure anybody is. It's a myth that people who talk about it don't do it. And I'll tell you what isn't a myth is that a lot of suicidal death is accidental. People didn't really mean to kill themselves. It was really a cry for help. It was really a manipulation, but they miscalculated how quickly the drugs acted or how dangerous what they were doing was in terms of driving or using a hose to pump carbon monoxide into a car or whatever. They just miscalculated the lethality of what they were doing. Or they were going to call you to come rescue them, and whoops, you didn't pick up. They got voicemail, so they were going to call back in a minute, but then they got too groggy and dropped their phone. Take it seriously every time. If somebody makes that threat to you, then just sitting right there with them, call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline on the speaker box and let them talk to somebody that is qualified to deal with it or call 911 and they will send the sheriff out there that will do a wellness check, and they may take them to the hospital and have them evaluated by a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Do encourage these people to get into treatment and support them when they do. You want to get educated, but you also want to get help for others. Do set boundaries. It's really important that you set boundaries because they will pull you in and pull you down. And do try to manage your response because they are going to blame you. There are three C's you need to hang on to here. You didn't cause it, you can't cure it, and you can't control it. So know that. This is above your pay grade. The three C's, you didn't cause it, You can't cure it. You can't control it. You have to manage your response here. You can't go into the shame tent. You can't go into the guilt tent when they put that guilt trip on you because you didn't cause this. And don't burden yourself with fixing it. You're not the one to fix it. I said it will respond to treatment, but you heard me describe DBT. These are highly trained professionals that conduct this type of therapy that helps these people if they're willing to get the help, and you're not qualified to do that. Now, it's really important that you keep yourself separate from this because, you know, I mentioned that there were four types of the borderline personality the discouraged or quiet, impulsive, petulant, and self-destructive. But there's something that's common to all four of these types, and that is there's a relationship dynamic that goes on. There's someone that's primary and somebody that's secondary. And there's the borderline primary and the borderline secondary. In families, for example, the parents are usually primary and the kids are secondary. At work, the roles aren't always as clear. I've seen primary borderline behavior in someone that might be reporting to you as their supervisor. And I've then seen the boss actually being secondary, the one that's being manipulated. So... You've got to really pay attention to if you have a borderline 
personality in your life that's pulling on your emotions, that's pulling on your behavior, that's doing all the things that we talked about in the beginning. These people that have these rapid changes, this impulsivity, this overreactivity, they're just roller coasters emotionally. So here's what I want you to ask yourself. Who has borderline behavior in your life? And stop and think about that right now. Write down the 10 key relationships in your life. Your best friends, your closest co-workers, the siblings that you interact with the most, your mother, your father, if you interact with them a lot, your spouse, whatever. Write down the top 10 core relationships in your life. And then go down that list and ask yourself, are any of these people people that I would have to say possess a lot of these characteristics that we've talked about in terms of borderline personality disorder? I mean, instability in relationships, moods, behavior identity, fear of abandonment, chronic fear of being left, overreactivity, impulsivity, those things. Are there people on this list of 10 people that are uniquely unstable, that vastly change in short periods of time? that get into relationships really deep, really fast, and then they fall apart just as quickly. People with fear of abandonment, pattern of unstable relationships, identity disturbance, impulsivity and self-destructive behaviors, self-harm, extreme emotional instability, chronic feelings of emptiness, explosive anger, transient stress-related paranoid ideation, Go through the 10 core relationships and ask yourself, do I have these people in my life and what is it doing to me? And are they pitching? Are they throwing this stuff at me all the time, all the time? Are they doing that? And you have to decide, I'm going to stand up for myself. I'm going to have healthy boundaries. I'm going to do the things that we talked about on the to-do list. I'm going to maintain those boundaries. I'm going to encourage them to get help. I'm going to take care of myself. Now, let's talk about what some of the don'ts are. Don't get sucked into their constant need for attention. Don't play the game. They will suck you dry. They are a bottomless pit. Don't take things personally. Don't be crushed when they blame you and accuse you of abandoning them, hurting them, betraying them. You can't take that personal. They're the ones that take it personal. No, this is who they are. It's not what you do. Remember, I said three C's. You didn't cause it. So you can't take things personally just because they're accusing you and pointing their finger at you. You can't be crushed by that. Don't start to normalize their dramatic behavior and ignore your intuition when it says it is not okay for them to do what they're doing. If you're seeing them be promiscuous, if you're seeing them take risky behaviors, if you're seeing them do things that you just know in your heart, this is just not okay. But they've done it so much that you just start normalizing it in your mind because you say, I'm just not going to react to this every time. So I just start accepting it as it's just normal. It's just who they are. It is who they are, but it isn't normal. So don't start to normalize their dramatic behavior. It's not okay if he goes out and sleeps with a different girl every three days because he gets so deep into relationships. 
so fast that he actually avoids intimacy. It's not okay if she's promiscuous and sleeps with everybody she meets. That's not okay for him or her. It's not okay if they're doing risky behavior, drugs, alcohol, driving under the influence. Those things are not okay. Those are high-risk behaviors that puts them in jeopardy because they don't value themselves. Do not allow boundary crossing. When you put up a boundary and you say, okay, we're not going there. We're stopping right here. You're not going to call me at 3 o'clock in the morning with your drama. Don't allow it. Don't always go the extra mile and be that go-to person for them to vent with. Don't be the one that they call every single time. And you may say, look, I want to be a good friend. I've known them since the third grade. I want to be there for them. No, you're enabling them. You don't want to do that. Don't believe they're going to snap out of it. I don't care what they say. If they say, okay, look, I I know. You I mean you're so great and you've been there for me and I'm I promise you it's the last time. Not gonna do this. Yes, they are. They're not gonna snap out of it. And you can wear yourself out. You can get up at three in the morning. You can sit up with them and cry till sunlight. You can assure them a thousand times that you're not betraying them, that you do love them, they're not going to change. They're not going to change because you can't fix it. They need professional help. Encourage that. Support that when they do it. Now, I don't want to contradict myself because I said don't get sucked into their constant need for attention and validation. You know, Don't play that game. Make it very clear that you love this person. Make it very clear how you feel, that you're there for them, that you love them. But once you've made that clear, you don't need to tell them 10,000 times. This is like someone with an eating disorder, which is very common in borderline personalities, constantly asking their mate or their mom or their dad, Do I look fat today? As soon as you start playing that game, they'll ask you a thousand times. Why? Because they want reassurance. And you think, well, if I tell them no, then they'll relax and not be so focused on it. No, they won't. What they want you to do is tell them again in three minutes that they don't look fat today. They get addicted to the reassurance. And then they stop believing you. And now they need more. You can't fix this. They're not going to snap out of it. They're not going to grow out of it. They're not going to snap out of it. They're going to improve with qualified treatment. And it's going to take time. And it's not going to be all or none. They're going to make some progress if they get in treatment and they stick with it. They're going to improve in some areas for a while, and then maybe some other areas for a while. And then they're going to have difficulties, and then they're going to have to really work at it some more. Maybe if it's a spouse, couples therapy will be appropriate. But make this list of 10 people, go down it, and see if you have people in your life that have these traits and characteristics. Now, I'm not asking you to self-diagnose. I'm not asking you to play diagnostician. I'm just asking you to look and see if you feel like these behaviors are present in your life and you need to set boundaries. That's what I'm asking you to do. Do you need to set boundaries? And if you need to set boundaries, then that's the thing that you need to do. Now, 
There's a whole lot more that I could go into with this. There's something called the Cartman Drama Triangle about being persecutor, rescuer, victim, and how you get caught in this loop. Look, I'm not trying to conduct a college course here. I'm just trying to tell you that this personality disorder exists. There's like 18 million people in the country that have this disorder. You may encounter people that have this in whole or part. And if you do, then I just want you to be prepared to recognize it and know what you need to do to protect yourself. You need to take care of yourself. Now, you may need to listen to this a couple of times because I've thrown a lot of information and a lot of data at you. But the whole purpose of this is for you to protect yourself. And two of the most predatory personality disorders are the narcissist and the bipolar disorder. That's why I've started with these, because these are the people that you need to recognize and protect yourself against the most. So if you need to listen to these over and over, so you recognize it and not get manipulated and victimized by it, then do so. That's the only reason I'm doing this is because you've asked for this information. So please, 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 do so. Now, I'm probably going to put some shorter versions answering some of your questions up for you guys to listen to instead of devoting an entire podcast to it. Like, how do you break up with these people? What if you're in a divorce situation with these people? What do you say to your kids if you are a borderline parent, you recognize that now, and you want to try to repair some of the damage that may have been done? I'll answer all those questions because I've been getting them email to me. I'll probably put those up in some shorter versions of the top 10 questions about borderline personality or top 10 questions about narcissism. Maybe I'll put those up and answer them. Look, I'm not the repository of all knowledge. I don't know all the answers to all the questions, but I'm a good researcher and I have a good, solid, fundamental understanding of these personality disorders, and then I go get the information I need from the people that are vertically developed in this area that have spent their whole career on this one particular disorder. I talk to them, I call them, I visit with them, I read their research, and I'm translating it and passing it on to you. And I'm really enjoying doing this, and I hope you're enjoying listening and watching and learning. So again, I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.